Anxious to not have this channel slip into being a series of watching various types of paint dry from differing, albeit fascinating, angles, today something different. I appreciate that some of the electrics installed prior to me starting this channel are somewhat shrouded in mystery, but bear with me. On summer sea trials, we needed lights to comply with the law, and I rigged up some temporary ones to keep us going. Alan's electrics mast is still laying around in storage, so the all-round nav light I casually duct taped onto the upper part of the driving console. It only needed a little 24 to 12 volt converter wired in. The equally temporary cables came down through the conduit, where the mast electrics will later end up, and run directly to the electrics console. The other light a 25-foot boat like Alan needs is a forward-facing bi-directional port and starboard indicator. I cable-tied one of them to the bow end uprights of the railings with some rubber pads to avoid plastic or metal creeping or friction damage. This front-facing bicolor light is looking pretty shoddy. It was simply put on there for the sea trials and so now I'm going to be making a proper mount for it. Unsurprisingly, freeing up this one didn't take a huge amount of specialist equipment or elbow grease. I've located it here so as to minimise visual obstructions from the already quite limited driver's console front window. Unlike other lifeboat conversions where a lot of fibreglass structure is removed to make the interior more light and pleasant, I'm keener to avoid compromising the shell. I'm going to mount a metal bracket to the rear of the light and then fix it all back onto the railing. For this, those amongst you with an angle grinder obsession will be delighted with what is to follow. I use these Munson rings a fair bit for constructing lightweight mounts. They're adaptable and cheap. The rubber pads stay put well and reduce creepage even under heavy vibration. I want the ring as close to the flat plate as possible so the weight of the light won't have a chance to move it all around. Whenever cutting off a male screw threaded rod, generally you're lucky if the end will accept a female screw thread, so I tidied it off with a flat wheel. This is the sort of precision craftsmanship people pay good money to enjoy. The rings are only zinc plated steel, so if outside, a good coating of appropriate primer and top coat means they're ready to mount up. The job of passing a couple of galvanized bolts through and finish with nylock nuts means we can get it on and off in future if needed. I wouldn't want to use stainless steel bolts and have the comment section a deluge of galvanic corrosion hysteria, terror and condemnation. I'm not overwhelmed by the build and fit of the light, but having looked at the range of them on the market, there's little to separate the cheaper and mid-market ones. As ever, it's mostly down to brand name. Even the ones costing hundreds with stainless steel mounts and casings still often only have the same really basic LEDs and connections inside, as far as my inspections could tell. The mounting is as simple as tightening the Munson ring screws, which self-lock under the slight spring in the steel rings themselves. I'll use some medium strength thread locker though to make sure. So there we go, mounted properly, near as damn it rock solid, and importantly, out of the main line of sight from the window. The switch, however, will need work when I finish the other light. Let's talk once again about the main battery bank. I did a quick intro for these in episode 12. In previous episodes, I've shown you a little bit about the power system, which is going to be these big lead carbon 12 volt batteries put together into a 24 volt system. So I showed you the basics when we were about to go and do the first C trials, but that was just operating with two batteries. And that's really all we needed to crank the uh, the engine and also to have the main power system running but eventually there's going to be a four battery system with one spare probably used as ballast somewhere else in the boat just in case one of them goes down so we can maintain two in series and two in parallel so combining the two so that there's a nice stable 24 volt system i haven't quite decided what to do about battery crank but because it's a fairly infrequent thing that you need to do and it'll take a high current for a short period of time i might possibly just have the engine crank from one of the main batteries they're definitely strong enough to be able to take that sort of current. The battery box itself I actually made quite some time ago when Alan was on his first iteration, the first expedition that I wanted to take Adam to go and do, uh, the one that I couldn't launch because of COVID. And I'm very happy with its design. It's a box made of glass fibre and so there's no real need to change it. Although I'd like to add a few um, modifications to it. I'd also like to try and streamline the lid a little bit, which I'll show you in a second. It also has a voltage meter built into it, which is not the right place to have it. So I'm gonna move that, including some more electrics around the back here. And that's gonna be my job now.
Anyhow, the battery setup. I currently only have three. Two are in series to make 24 volts feeding Alan's power, and a spare merely wired up to crank the engine's starter. Once I have funds, I'll get a couple more so that there's the other pair giving another 24 volts in parallel, and a spare that'll live wherever I can find space for it. I use Anderson plugs for all high current connections, ubiquitous and quick to put together as they are. Here, grey is for between the batteries, yellow will be for connecting to charging circuits, and red for the actual circuit into the distribution panel through the isolator switches above. Of late, I've extended my reading about battery care, and especially banks that combine series and parallel layout for 12 volt lead carbon batteries. It appears we need to balance them with a battery balancer, and this clip of me pretending that I've only just unboxed it and then showing you where the leads go presumably helps illustrate. I want to mount it somewhere unobtrusive and thought the inner inside of the, yes, vented, battery box lid would be an efficient use of space. But then I saw this in the instructions. Apparently it needs to be upright. Can anyone who can self-certify as a YouTube expert or even a real one tell me if this is a real concern? Surely a solid state device can be mounted any way up. I recall I had a subscriber who worked for Vitron, but maybe he's jumped ship, so to speak. A second best spot would be the rear panel of the battery box, but I like to avoid it for neatness's sake, or maybe somewhere else even less proximate. And this is the old lid in question, the one that weighs a ton, and was only employed due to its convenient shape and size all those months ago, when I was hurriedly getting Alan ready for action. I'll use it as a mould to make a more wieldy version, and I want to clear the voltage meter panel from the lid too, so that things can be mounted atop it. I designed the panel, one of these meters for each battery, so that they can be quickly unplugged and reconnected as convenient. They only carry a tiny current, wired in series across each battery. So all of this still revolves around Allen's Master Electrics panel. You saw the analog ammeters for the low power circuit before, and the one for the high power circuit earmarked for the inverter too, but I've added a digital meter as well, as it has a useful cumulative power consumption function. I can switch it off in the event of serious power rationing. As I've learned the, well, head-scratchingly confusing way by trying to work out why meters gave conflicting readings, you need to carefully match our meters to the correct shunt size, or else it's like trying to understand something very difficult to understand. Right, well that's been a fun one. I promise much more electrics will appear in the coming months, including my charging strategy, but I also have structural jobs that are past due on Alan's demanding to-do list. For an inanimate object, it's odd how he never lets me get a moment to myself. That's all. Buy my books, please, as that's the decent and honourable course of action. Bye.